All right, here we are. We're back. Okay, I'm, I'm having, I'm still having technical difficulties. I'm taking these off. All right, sorry. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, um, Facebook Live. Um, your same cast of characters. I'll let uh, everybody introduce themselves. I'm Terrence Sullivan. I've been with Sierra Nevada 26 years. I'm a brand manager. And I like drinking our beers and talking about our beers. So I'm here with a couple esteemed colleagues. I will let, um, we'll go by alphabet. Byron, you go first. So I'm Byron Wetch. Uh, Terrence has been putting up with me for the last 13 years here at Sierra Nevada. Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, failed master Cicerone and all those fun things. So Charlie, take it away. All right, Charlie Bamforth. Been in the brewing industry since most of you were born or longer than that 42 plus years and uh, last couple of years senior quality advisor for Sierra Nevada Brewing Company nice to be here again excellent excellent now 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 the headphones are working so I, I can't figure it out I know I right? talked them into that I you know the way I spoke this sort of, you know. <laughs> I, think it's time, was, I thought Byron was muted I mean is, isn't that what everybody says now you're on mute well, you know, a lot of people would pay good money to have that button in, in real life for me, just be able to mute me at any point. So, <laughs> Byron, I'm, I'm looking at your backdrop has changed dramatically. Yes, it has. Uh, I went with the uh, gearhead. Okay, uh, you're going muscle, muscle cars on it. Yeah, muscle cars on ice, man. We were Char actually we were talking about this. Charlie ha has rearranged his... Uh, his books. His football no, I just, moved, I just moved the laptop to a different angle. That's all. Yeah. Okay, I, I I rotated mine so you can now see my kayak back there. See, yeah. oh, nice. and some yeah. beers on the shelf. Well, so. I can't even swim, so I, I uh, kayak means nothing. Yeah, don't, don't don't get in the kayak. <laughs> <laughs> That's not advisable. Uh, all right, so uh, cheers, everybody. Yes, cheers. So, cheers. You're very good help. If, if you just like jumped on and you didn't read the, the pregame to this, uh, we are here to talk hops, hops, and more hops. And, more hops. and yeah. all the hops. All the hops. Yeah. So we're going to we're gonna start with our uh, kind of our, I guess this is going into winter season. Uh, and the, these are all of our releases that we uh, normally do. And then we're adding a little uh, fun one, Dankful. Uh, which is a new release uh, from Sierra Nevada, so um, so we got that one. But um, we're going to start with Northern Hemisphere Harvestdale. Now, the, the where this beer originated from was an idea that we got from uh, Gerard Lemon. You know him, Charlie. Yeah, Gerard Lemons. There's an S Lemons. On yes, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know him well. Yeah, from way back. Actually, he, he was a uh, maltster. Right, originally, I think he was originally, yeah, but yeah. He, yeah. Then he uh, he dabbled in hops a little bit, but um, mm -hmm. he uh, he asked us year, years ago. This was probably right around two thousand. Um, if we had ever played with uh, a wet hop beer, so uh, hops directly out of the field, um, and it never really dawned on us, and so we had this idea of. Uh, of doing this wet hop beer. So this is a hundred percent wet hop. So we, we literally bring the hops down from Yakima Valley. Um, we get a phone call when the truck gets to the border, uh, uh, the, the Oregon, California border. And that's our, that's our cue to start brewing. Uh, so we'll start mashing in at that time, maybe a little bit before that, but we'll start mashing in at that time. And, uh, and then the truck arrives and we're offloading the hops, uh, and we're weighing up that first edition uh, right right when they get into the warehouse. So, um, anyways, talk about the changes, Byron, this year. So this year, in previous years, and just to let everybody know, um, you know, with hop selection and things like that, usually everybody goes up and picks them. Uh, this year we did it in house, and it was a lot of fun. Um, but what happens with this is hops, the different varietals in previous years, we'd used Cascade, we'd used Centennial. And, you know, with hops, with this type of thing, with wet hops, it's super critical to have them pick, bring them down and brew with them right away. Because, you know, as three to four days goes along after they're not dried, uh, as wet hops, they start to smell like shallots. And then about five or six days later, they start to so, smell like onions. So it's super, super critical to have those uh, thrown in the kettle right away. So 
because Cascade and Centennial never came into fruition at the same time, we'd have a truck come down with the Centennial, uh, brew that batch, and then we'd have a truck come down with the Cascade and brew a separate batch, and then we'd blend those two together. And over the last couple of years, you know, Terrence and I would sneak off to the cellar, uh, do some product research, as we like to say, and, you know, we'd always try it. And the last couple of years, the Centennial just really knocked it out of the park. And we were like, oh, this is this is great. So this year we decided to do 100% Centennial uh, wet hops in this beer. And that's that's the big change for this. So for those of you that are out there going, man, this this tastes a lot different than last year. You're right. It is a little bit. It is a different take than we have done for the previous years. So yeah, it's a 100% wet hop. For those of you that decide to do that at home, uh, make sure you use four to five times the amount of hops that we, you would use dried hops. Uh, that's the conversion rate. So it's really funny when we do this, and Terrence has been part of this. The guys, all hands on deck. You know, the hops are literally floating almost to the top of the kettle door and coming out and Terrence can touch a little bit on brewing that beer and how sticky and smelly and fun it is. So, sorry, I was trying to hit my mute button. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife just pulled up. So I thought I, you guys didn't have to hear the car pulling up. Um, so uh, Charlie, uh, I don't know if Ken has ever told you this story, but, uh, but I, but I remember it, uh, uh, pretty well, uh, because the first time we decided to actually make this beer, we didn't know how to get the hops here. Right. Um, so we talked to the hop supplier and they're like, Oh, we'll put them in boxes. We'll punch a bunch of holes in them. And, uh, you know, how many pounds you need. And so then we were, we were kind of calculating out that, uh, uh, wet weight versus dry weight and figuring out, uh, to how much we should send. Right. Well, uh, it didn't all fit on one plane. Uh, so they flew them down. And so we had to, uh, we had to get another plane. Uh, and I think we did UPS is, is how we, how we sent them down. And, uh, and a look on the driver's face, whenever he had these boxes of this stuff that just, you know, was pretty aromatic, uh, on his plane, he was wondering what the hell we were, <laughs> we were having shipped down from Washington. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, uh, all the hops uh, arrive. And then, uh, of course, Ken had the bill in front of him and i rem rem remember him going to dressler and going you better not have screwed this thing up because if this <laughs> beer is a good uh uh someone's gonna have to pay the price but luckily it was an amazing beer and uh and we um continue to do it now we do it they they fill them up in little um uh like uh big totes that are uh perforated totes uh that they use for like i think cherries uh, like cherry totes and they bring them down that way in a refrigerated truck and stuff. So uh, they, they got it down now. So it's the nearest the brewing industry gets to the crush, really. I mean, that, that's the analogy from, you know, the wine guys who are all busy crushing their, their grapes as fast as they can so they can make them into wine before they spoil. And this is the closest thing. But of course, when the hops are harvested, what are they? About 70, 71 percent moisture. Yeah. And, and 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 the dried hop is is going to be about nine percent. So uh, it's a lot of water in there. You know, it's a lot, of, a lot of moisture, and it'll spoil pretty quickly. I'm surprised the pilot didn't get overcome by the fumes. I don't know. You know but... Yeah, right. <laughs> get 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 a little sleepy. Yeah, a little yeah. sleepy on the way down. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. So this uh, this recipe too is it's very uh, very similar to Celebration Ale, which I think we're going to pop next. Um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it was really kind of a way of like, uh, having a, a similar beer that's different, you know, really. Um, and this is actually, this is brewed all on the, uh, East side. So on our, our original hundred barrel brew house. Um, so it's got a, 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 to me, it has a little bit, uh, Little little different nuances. Obviously, the hop profile is different uh, than Celebration Ale, but uh, it tends to have a little bit of a kind of a little more roasty characteristic to it. Right. You know, this is uh, this is kind of classic uh, Sierra Nevada American style uh, IPA or West Coast style IPA, and you know, features some caramel malt in there and stuff. So it's good. And of course, Centennial is. I mean, if you look at the sort of the 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 nature of the flavor, the aroma that's coming from Centennial, it's right over in the, the, the fruity sort of citrus area. Um, yeah, not too far away from Cascadian, sort of three-dimensional space. But, um, 
You know what I you know what I get off of this though, Charlie, a lot uh with centennials. I get I get like a rose characteristic in it, like almost a floral, yeah, uh, floral rose note that yeah, yeah, that I particularly like in this beer. This is this is one of my I mean, this is one of those ones that uh and we're gonna get into it with uh celebration ale, but this is one of those beers that you know myself and a lot of people at the brewery we look forward to its release. It's like that kind of coveted uh, nice, nice beer that you're always curious of. Uh, it's like you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rose by any other name. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, and it's such a fleeting moment. I mean, this is one of the, you have that short, short, tiny window to pick those hops and get them down here to brew with them. And then 99.999% of the rest of the hops get dried because otherwise they, they, won't, they won't keep. You just have this very, very little, tiny, fleeting window and the brewers, it's, you know, we get this in and we get some of the other hops in. And it's like, it's like Christmas. They're just opening yeah. up all these boxes and they just have this grin. And, you know, this one with the delicacy of the, the hops, because the wet hop is so fleeting, you know, we actually recommend that this be consumed within 100 days of bottling it. Because we feel like within three months, it's it's losing that rose and it's losing those super bright wet characters you know i think i think that uh, I, I remember ken saying to me one time the, the reason why sierra nevada stick to whole cone hops is is that you know as soon as you do anything to a hop you take something away from it you know and if you right. you pelletize it or whatever you're going to take something away and i remember him saying you know the, the the ultimate is is the fresh hop it's the it's the undried hop but right. if you if you don't dry it and you don't sort of keep it cold and keep it airtight, it, it'll it'll deteriorate with time. So, you you know, that, that's why for this type of beer, it really is a, a very special window of opportunity, as you said, Byron. But, you know, realistically, to brew beer the rest of it, you, you, you got you to gotta dry the hops, you know. Right. That's a good point, Charlie. You know, I, uh, a lot of people, um, you know, I, I, I love beer and I love brewing beer and, you um, it, it, but it but it's challenging um you know the 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 winemakers um you know it, it, it's it's very stressful during a certain portion of whenever they're bringing you know the harvesting the grapes and they're bringing them in and they're crushing them and uh they're letting fermentation take place and stuff but um they you know to to be able to have like if you look at something like pale ale that we're trying to brew all year long um and having consistency with raw ingredients that are potentially starting to age a little bit over the course of a year. Right. Yeah. I mean, no matter how you store them, you know, yeah. and, and that, that's certain things that, you know, we've done over time of, you know, working with our vendors to, to have, you know, some of our hops stored in nitrogen, uh, you know, purged bags and, you know, out of light and all those kind of things. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's a skilled thing. It's, you know, I, I always wonder what the wine guys do the rest of the year. You know, they help. You know? <laughs> they drink beer. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they drink beer. <laughs> Takes a lot of great beer to make great wine. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, you know, and that's the thing with the hop harvest this year too. It was so I, I you know, because we did it remotely this year, the growers would, and it's crazy because that's the same thing with them. They spend all summer long growing this crop. And then suddenly one day, and it's never the same day, never this, you know, every every year it's a little bit different. And suddenly these poor guys are driving around their hop yard harvesting hops for two, three, four days straight. And uh, then sending them down, and we had to make hop selections so they overnight them. But, you know, it's always funny when the guys are breaking up hops. Every once in a while, you know, they'll find somebody's set of car keys in there, you know, things like that. Because, these, you know, the growers are working – overtime to get this done because there's no short window two three days too late and the hops have started to turn yeah so, yeah yeah we used to send uh tom nielsen up there to to kind of um you know monitor the hops and kind of tell tell the the growers when we wanted them picked and dried and what charlie what happened like if you can explain a little bit like during the drying process of the hop um you know what you, 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 potentially you can screw everything up it's like oh, it's just can. like it's just like beer it's like when you package beer you can screw it up on the on the very last day but um 
a little bit about like what happens during that drying process. Well, it's it's uh, basically an airflow process that uh, is, is where you're, you're gradually bringing off that moisture and you're bringing it down as low as possible. And the point is that you know if you if you you are drying, you are going to be bringing off a little, some a little bit of well some of the hop aroma because these oils are volatile. I mean, I always say, you know, that's how you can tell a brewer. They, they rub hot between their hands and smell. That's a, you know, that's the archetypal image of a of a brewer. So it doesn't take much. You just warmth of your hands to, to, to release the aroma from the leucolin glands and so on. So if you're actually bringing air through and drying them down, then it's, uh, you know, it's a balance between bringing off that moisture uh, gently um, but, uh, you know, preserving as much of that aroma as you possibly can. Used to be done in, 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 in things called oast houses. If you go to my native England these days in Kent or Hereford and Worcester, you'll see these sort of conical shaped roofs on these, uh, these old buildings. And th these days they're very expensive properties and so on, but they used to be sort of the dry hops. And of course, a, a very seasonal as Byron said, a very seasonal activity. So, you know, a lot of uh, labor will be brought in to, right. to pick the hops. People from London will go down. And and I, I take my, uh, when, when I used to take classes over to the UK every so, every second summer, we'd go to a hop yard in Hereford and Worcester. And a lot of people would come in from uh, Eastern Europe to pick the hops. And then they, once the hops were picked, they'd go on to another crop and then another crop and so on. So... Yeah. It's funny when I started in the beer world, people would always talk romantically about the English harvesting hops and how they would take this nice vacation to the countryside to go pick hops. And, you know, the first time I started picking hops and help, I'm covered in all the, the binds. I'm itchy. I'm, oily. I'm just like, I'm like, who, like, this is not a vacation. It's like one of those little myths that you always hear about. Uh, yeah, right. you know, they were they will go out to the countryside and have fun and have picnics and it's just like oh pick the hops and it's like then you're covered in oil and you're like this is but it's so rewarding to throw those right in the kettle. Yeah. One of one of the things I've noticed um over the years of of uh dealing with you know or or working with the hop industry and stuff is is a lot of research uh, with the drying process and trying to, you know, cause, cause you can dry the hops really fast and, you know, blow a bunch of really hot air cr across them and lose a lot of the aromatics of the hops. Um, but, you know, and brewers are starting to kind of demand, uh, you know, a, a slower drying process. So, um, speaking of dryers, that's, that's the dryer back there, <laughs> my wife back there, uh, uh, filling the dryer. Uh, so anyways, um, but, uh, that's good timing, huh? Uh, so anyways, but uh, th the, the fact that, um, I, I think, you know, it, all, all this goes into the fact of, of, you know, what IPAs are a little bit more expensive to make, right? Because you're using a lot more hops, but also too, is there's, uh, there's certain varieties that, uh, you know, don't yield as much, but they're going to get aromas that, that you, you know, you really want in your beer. And also, too, the process by which uh, they're drying them is a slower process, and, and it all takes time, right? It does take time, you know, and, but it's, 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 it's worth the investment, the, the time and effort to get it right. You know, I, there's, a, there's a lot of brewers in the world that use – they use hop extracts. I mean, they, they take the hops and they're, they're, they're being extracted with coal, carbon dioxide, and they're extracting the bitterness and extracting the oils and the aroma and they're putting them back. You know, in my experience, when people do that, the beers, they're not very drinkable. I, and I, and I, you know, I've been in the industry a long time. I've done a lot of research, but I don't know of any research which really explains why. But if you use whole cone hops, the beers are so much better and better balanced. Much more, they're much more drinkable. Um, and if, if you make them with sort of extracts and, and, and playing games and, and tipping in these liquids, to it's not the same. It's not the same. So you know, a lot of effort going into to getting the hop right is 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 time and money well spent. Yeah, good point. I think there was a couple of questions that rolled by, Kevin. If you're back there. Uh... Uh, in the green room, you want to throw those up there? Okay, Byron, right. go read read that out. I'm, so I'm are you ready? Yeah. 
Are you ever concerned with insects, etc., that might be in the hops while adding to the kettle, or not a big deal? I'll assume there's a decent inspection of the hops before they are just thrown in. So, um, you know, from yeah, Terrence, Charlie. Yeah, uh, naturally, it's a, it's a it's a crop. Uh, you know, definitely when you when we get baled hops, uh, you'll get certain things. Uh, I remember one time we had, we got a. Uh, a two by eight, uh, down the center, <laughs> center of a, a bale of hops. Uh, and I remember, uh, uh, Dressler took it and shipped it back up to the, uh, hop supplier and said, uh, I want to be reimbursed the weight of this, uh, block of wood that's sitting in my, uh, uh, <laughs> For the but, but honestly, it's like a lot of the equipment is, um, you know, and, and yeah, there's, there's, there's insects, uh, we're, I mean, we're not, looking for them you're not going to see them but you know there is uh you know spider mites is a bad thing uh with with hop fields but a lot of that's being taken care of in the field uh by the farmers um but i will say like one of the the hardest things using whole cone hops and one of the things that we fear the most is uh pieces of equipment that might have fallen off that uh that actually get into the bale and then they'll get into our you know, into the auger that, uh, you know, when we're, when we're extracting out all the hops and getting the hops out of the kettle, they'll get stuck in the auger and break the auger. So that's one of the main worries that we have. So we found out they make these thing, it's called a uh, metal detector. Uh, and we literally <laughs> scan the, our, our bales, uh, before we start breaking them up and, and, uh, we, we do a better job of breaking them up and, uh, getting them, you know, totally, uh, ready to go for the kettle so yeah and a oh, lot of the pests question. like mites you know once the plant matter is dried they have really no reason to stick around you know right. a lot of the pests that will will attack that um you know and then i think about you know when hops are pelletized when we break them up we usually find you know like one time the guys found a cell phone in there you know somebody found a whole lunch pail that somebody had dropped accidentally and it still had the full soda can in there and it, I don't know nobody ate the sandwich and tried it out. But yeah, it's uh then I think about like when, you know, the hops are pelletized and it's nothing to anyone using it. Like they go through an extruder. So all that stuff like in their filters and screens. So I think it's like any other food product. We, we do a pretty rigorous boil. So uh, I don't think anyone thing's going to survive 90 minutes of seeing it at 212. Yeah, hops are, hops are very sensitive. Uh, crop really i mean very very susceptible to uh infection um it's i would i would have thought the bigger much bigger worry for for hops is 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 disease hop diseases and so on the wilts and the fusariums and the uh, blight and so on but but it, you know that's why a lot of attention is paid into when they're you know grown um to actually make sure that uh, they're protected. And, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people who, you know, a lot of hop growers who are not very keen to have visitors when, you know, be, they don't want people who right. are tramping through some field or something yeah. and then suddenly they bring a bootload of stuff onto the hop yard, you know? So, yeah, that, well, that that's one of the things I've noticed over the years is, is how that's changed a lot. Like even when you go to visit, you know, you're putting your, you got a, you know, a little, keep your hair out it, it's like a food product right so you're wearing uh you know you're putting booties over your uh your shoes and stuff yeah. like that before you're actually walking in yeah. so they they really care about that stuff a lot more you know you you were talking about the uh the you know composting right as because the hops are wet well the 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 bind and the leaves and all that stuff that they extract out whenever uh uh when they're processing the hops um I, I remember one time, uh, one of the first years I was there and, and I watched these uh, workers in the hop fields uh, and they would go in the morning and they put their burritos uh, in the in the pile of waste because it was composting. So by the time lunchtime came, they had this nice warm burrito and they would pull it out <laughs> and, and, uh, and lunch on it. So, you know, hey, they're pretty smart, right? They're uh, Talk, Talking to smart, this is, this is by the by, but, uh, you know, these hop guys... The, when you think about it, the, there's only one real outlet for hops, and that's making beer, you know. So they're always trying to find some alternative thing. And years ago, I don't think it was Jared Lemon's company, but somebody else's, they made some aftershave lotion, aftershave splash made out of hops. And they gave me some. 
So I splashed it on. I splashed it on. It didn't do anything for my love life, I can tell you. <laughs> In fact, next time know. you got pulled over, the, the police were like, uh, we've been smoking, sir. Yeah. No, they said, hi, honey. <laughs> That's what I always fear. fear. You, you smell like a brewery. Well, of course. I was just working in one. Um, yeah. All right. I think we're going celebration land, right? Oh, yeah. My my favorite favorite time of the year. I think there was a question that popped up. Was that was that right, Kevin? Is there a question that slammed through? I think it was more of a comment. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm having trouble multitasking. The wine guys always say during the crush, you can't make great great wine without great beer. This is yep. this is very true. This is very true, and that's uh, that's coming from old Scott Jennings. I would Im uh, imagine that that's our uh, uh, extraordinaire, uh, innovative recipe formulator. Hey, sorry about my my nail right there. I, I crushed my fingernail, so it looks a little tacky. Actually, Terrence owed me money, so I took a bite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and you know that's what happens. You know, you know, I, I just have to say that this is like, I, I kind of searched a lot in the West Coast for uh, a beer that would that really reminded me of like, you know, Summit Brewing Company's take on the English IPA. And when I got out here, it was, it was always very, very citrusy. And this was the first one that had that nice earthy, herbal, traditional East Coast, West Coast English. And... Yeah, you know, I'm just going to say, Terrence, I really get the nutmeg and cinnamon this year. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> this always comes through, doesn't it? Yeah. It's amazing. Mm. Uh, every, every year we have people that ask us about what what uh, what spices. And then uh, uh, and, and actually the other day, Ken and I were on uh, doing a doing a show. And uh, and we were talking about how um, how many comments we get about this beer. Because um, it's, it's just one of those beers that... I look forward to, I know a lot of people look forward to this beer being released. And uh, uh, we always judge whether it's a good year by if we get uh, half the comments say it's better than last year and half the comments say it's worse than last year. Uh, not as hoppy. So so we always know if we got that 50-50, we know we're doing, uh, doing something good. Uh, so Duke actually had a question that just popped up there and it was in regards to uh, uh, whether Celebration is just a fresh hop uh, torpedo. And so when you say fresh hop, it is, uh, it's made with the hops, uh, that year, but actually torpedo, um, torpedo came out of celebration ale, uh, in essence. And, and really what happened was, is, uh, we had one means of dry hopping back in the day and it was in dish bottom tank. So we would, we would ferment into one tank, usually the open fermenters, and then we'd transfer into a dish bottom tank that had a manway in the side. So an opening in the side and we could shove the hops in there uh, and then dry hop that way. Well, as, as demand increased for Celebration Ale, we had to figure out a way to dry hop our beers externally on the outside of the tank. And so that's how the torpedo was actually developed. Uh, and we used Celebration recipe in the test batches of that uh and so actually i think our first batch was uh was in the summertime and we made a, a celebration ale uh and we we dumped the whole thing uh but we we did it for tasting purposes to see how closely we can match celebration ale and the hop character dry hop character uh that's in celebration and then uh we, well, actually, we didn't dump it all. We sold some in the pub. Uh, and people got really excited about it. And a couple of uh, uh, bars, at least back east, uh, especially in New York, um, uh, inquired about it. And so we thought, okay, we, we can actually start making an IPA year-round. Um, and then that's how Torpedo was born. Torpedo has a different hop profile uh, than Celebration Ale. Celebration Ale is... You know, a lot of ways, this is how I describe celebration, and, and I'm, I'm stealing it from the, the first person that trained me to brew at Sierra Nevada, and he said, think of celebration ale as all the flavors and all the characteristics of pale ale, but take two of those and shove them into one bottle. And then if you're going to have a Bigfoot, take two celebrations <laughs> ales and celebrations and shove them into one bottle. And, and that's kind of how the, the flavor profile and characteristics. So this is Cascades and Centennials. Uh, it's 6.7% uh, uh, alcohol, 6.8, uh, sorry, uh, 
uh, Northern Hemisphere is six seven, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Yep. And, um, so, anyways, uh, this is just a beautiful beer. It's a, it's. I'm I'm gonna let you guys talk a little bit about it because I can go on for hours talking about this. Beer. Oh well, I could too. And you know, it's uh, it's funny because I, as a as a Midwest kid, going back to that, we don't have winter here. We have three springs and one crazy warm summer. And to me, October always feels like March. Like I get a little lost and that's what celebration always brings me back. It's like, Oh, it's the fall and you know, Christmas is going to be here soon and the holidays. So this is my version of when it starts to snow around here is when celebration comes out. And you know, it's funny when that you talk about the torpedo, cause that idea, it seemed like Northern hemisphere, all came of you guys having a few beers at the bar and coming up with those ideas. So if anyone's wondering where inspiration comes from, it's usually when we're, we're hanging out somewhere and having a few beers, but yeah, I love this beer. I, I look forward to it every year. Charlie. Yeah. It's a beautifully balanced beer. Really it is. You know, I mean that, the, the malt is coming through as well uh, and, and those hops, you know, and, I'm, I'm just comparing it with the, the, the previous one. The, this one is a little bit smoother, you know, a little bit smoother uh, to the taste, beautifully balanced. Um, I think it's got some Chinook in here as well. Is that right? No, no, just Cascade and Centennial. Just Cascade and Centennial, is it? Well, it, it is It is good. I, it, I, I'm not sure I've mentioned this before, but you know the – I probably do because I tell this story all the time. But the first time I ever uh, came up to Chico, I sat with Ken and and I was trying the beers, and I said, "You know, Ken, your beers are about as hoppy as I can take them." And and he said, 25 years ago I was brewing in a bucket. Now I'm brewing hundreds of thousands of barrels every year. Do you mind if I dig with it?" I said, "Go for it," you know. And <laughs> now, now I just you know those hops. The, the that's what I'm looking for all the time. More, more, and more. More and more of the hoppy character. I just, I just, it is a great beer. Charlie, I'm starting to lose it. So I'm, I'm literally looking lose at it. It, have Chinook, it doesn't have Chinook in it, does it? I don't know. I, I don't uh, know. I thought it was Centennial Chinook and Cascade, but oh, uh, my damn. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make myself look like a fool here. Oh, by the way, the the recycle uh, truck is coming. I'm muting. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you don't yeah. jump on the truck, Terrence will be okay. Well, yeah. it's still loud because it's Terrence's recycling bin, yeah. which probably has lots of these bottles because we just came out with it a couple weeks ago. So I'm sure his whole recycle bin is just filled with these bottles. No, it's not because I people come around and get five cents back on them. Yeah, that, my neighbor, my neighbor complained whenever he first <laughs> moved in and he said, he said, shit, how much beer do you guys drink over there? Because man, that <laughs> thing is noisy in the morning. Now they, now they come at four, four o'clock in the afternoon. And you are right, Charlie. Chinook is in the bitter. Why did I, why did I forget that? How do I forget that? I don't know. I just I just checked it on the site. And I know <laughs> you you were at, I, just, I knew I knew you were right after you said it because I knew you were like, oh wait, I need all the specs, and I'm like, they're all in my head, but my head's all scrambled. <laughs> I have no idea. I got to do my homework, you know. So I think that's one of the reasons, Terrence, is that you know we've been brewing this for 38, 39 years. That uh, yeah. after that long, it's hard to keep track of all the hops. That we put 80, in. 81 was the first year. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Byron. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was like the first Christmas time. Um, I know we have a bottle upstairs in the collection, one of the old long neck pry off bottles. And it doesn't really even say celebration on it. It's just Merry Christmas and a tall neck bottle. And right. Yeah, it's uh it's, it's an amazing beer. It's still like for those of you that are really wanting to geek out about this, this is still the original five beers are all bottle condition. This one is bottle condition. So if you ever home brewing and you're like, oh man, I forgot the yeast, you know, pour most of this out, sterilize the top of it and, you know, give your homebrew bucket. Or if you ever want to build our yeast, there's some fun little experiments to do with that. So, so I was gonna I was gonna tell you a little bit about how, wh why this beer is so special to me um, because so the the very first year I, I worked at Sierra Nevada so we're going back 1994 and uh, they asked me if I wanted to go to hop selection and it was like oh the uh, uh, so so I went to hop selection oh by the way too uh, you'll love this one uh, Charlie is a uh, 
I was like so nervous because uh, it, it was it was Bart and Steve, and then we had our lab lab uh, director uh, Melanie. She was she was on the trip with us, and uh, they're like, "Hey, you get a room." This is back when we didn't have individual rooms. We couldn't afford it. We all just kind of uh, shared rooms. So I I shared a room with uh, Ken, and I was like, "Oh wow, you know." I was like, <laughs> I started working at the company, and I got I got to share a room with Ken. That's like you. Uh, I was just scared, right? Um, and it turns out uh, Ken, Ken, Ken snores uh, pretty loud. So, uh, too much information. So I, I know, too much information. <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, so now I know why Barton uh, and Steve stuck me with Ken. Uh, <laughs> 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 hey, yeah, right. Um, but, uh, but anyways, uh, so I went up for hop selection and like picking out the hops and, and, and knowing that, you know, we use so much cascade and we use so, so much Centennial and, and mainly Centennial for this and, uh, and Bigfoot, it just that selecting the hops was such a uh, knowing that it was going to go into this beer. So then you came back home and like the hops are arriving at that point and you're actually brewing with it. And that whole, like, you got to select them and you got to pick them out. And now they're, you know, at the brewery and now you're sticking them in the kettle and, and you're uh, making up the dry hop sacks and it, just everything about it. And it was like, it, it became this ritual for every brewer uh, to go through that process of brewing. And then what does it taste like in the fermenter? And then, Oh, it's being filtered. And of course this is bottle conditioned. Um, so so we add some yeast and some some sugar back to it and it's 14 days in the warehouse before we actually release the beer so it's this anticipation of you know it's a, it's about a month from the day you brew it uh to to where you can really drink it and it presents itself as it does right now and i just this beer is just special to me it's an art form actually terence i mean i i know that you know the art and science of brewing but you know if, if this is a classic example of the art of brewing i mean it it, it really is i mean in right. every respect i mean it's a it's a thing of beauty yeah yeah and it's you know it's one of those ones that i i don't feel like it's people always ask me is like you know there might be some nuanced changes from year to year but uh but in reality it's just uh it's just yeah, and there's it. so much work that goes into this: stuffing those dry hop bags, carabining them up into the fermenter, just so much actual labor. And you know, people always ask, "Why do we use whole? Like, why don't we use pelletized hops and things like that?" And well, you know, we do a lot of things here that, uh, if you look at the bottom line, it's just a bad business decision just looking from the money aspect yeah, but, but there are things that look, at, look at derek's hard. question look at derek's yeah. question i mean there oh, you yeah. go right there uh right <laughs> um, so uh so the 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 beers that are bottle condition pale ale porter stout celebration ale and so those are our founding beers that uh ken originally made and a lot of bottle conditioning process was based off of his home brewing knowledge and uh we had pretty uh archaic or not not state-of-the-art uh bottling equipment uh in the early days um so he he would use uh bottle conditioning as a means of uh also too we didn't have the tanks uh that could handle high pressure uh things of that nature so that you could carbonate naturally he's always been a fan of natural carbonation whether it's within the tank or it's within the bottle um, so our tanks couldn't handle uh, pressure rating uh, to, to. They were all dairy tanks way back. Then. Yeah, to produce the carbonation oh. levels, and also too, he found with the bottling line that um, he he could eliminate uh, some oxygen pickup issues. And maybe Charlie, you can talk a little bit about uh, like uh, how what yeast does uh, with oxygen, um, and 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 what oxygen does to beer that's bad. Well, ox oxygen is the big enemy of beer. Um, the only the only good thing about oxygen is you know the yeast needs some, so you give you give the yeast some before fermentation. But oxygen in the finished beer is just bad news. It it, it give the beer picks up more color, it picks up more turbidity uh, for those beers where you don't want turbidity. But particularly, it causes beer to go stale, so you get the sort of flavors of you know um, wet cardboard and tomcat pee uh, and we don't want that so 
one of the, one of the I mean, that's, so uh, so that's what uh, when one of the reasons why uh, Sierra Nevada only have pry off crown corks uh, caps because there's a tighter seal, um, and also there's the advantage of of the, the the yeast in the beer because the yeast will do two things. First of all, it, it kind of dines on the, the stale substances. So as fast as the stale substances are made, the, the yeast gets rid of them. But the second thing is it, it scavenges the oxygen. It mops up the oxygen. So, so the, the bottle conditioning is fantastic for, for extending the flavor life um, of beer. Um, and um, it, 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 it just is so very, very important that, that uh, you you minimize that oxygen level, so bottle conditioning is a great thing. Yeah, and it it adds a it adds a certain flavor to the beer too. Because I know back in the day, whenever I first started working there, there was, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of warehouse space, and so as we were growing as a company. Um, that was an option like, oh, we could get rid of bottle conditioning and, you know, it takes 14 days. So you're, you're storing 14 days worth of beer in your warehouse where normally a brewery, uh, you know, I gotta, I gotta say, Charlie, probably maybe not even a week's worth of inventory in their warehouse, probably. A, a yep. Given, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so it was like, oh, okay, maybe we can get rid of bottle conditioning. And so we actually looked at, um, a few batches of pale ale and we realized that, no way, man. That just totally changes the flavor profile of that beer when you take out that bottle conditioning process. I remember Ken showing me photographs from in the early days there when uh, sort of, you know, in the, in the first brewery he had, and they used to leave all the, the, the cases open because, you know, until they perfected it, there was a, there was a variation in some of the bottles. <laughs> Yeah. So they just waited, and and once they're confident that they were going to survive, they 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 fill them all up with all the the good stuff, uh, sealed it, and yeah. Then they got to ship it out. You know, yeah. Brilliant. I remember those, those, those pictures are awesome. But for yeah. my days, for my days uh, in Bass, you know, we had a, a we had a, a bottle condition beer called White Shield, and you could actually see the the yeast at the bottom of the bottle, and it was it was about a, a centimeter and a half an inch deep in the bottom of the bottle and, and the skill was in pouring it very carefully and we used to have it in the laboratory in the research laboratory uh, and it was we have cases of it can you imagine and at 10 o'clock every morning one of my team would go and have his first white shield of the day and pour it very very carefully to make sure that the yeast stayed in the bottle and then he'd, he'd drink the yeast out of the bottle and it was <laughs> that was wow. his vitamin, that was his vitamins for the day <laughs> Wait, I thought, I thought they're vitamins. Well, they are, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm translating it so you can understand what they're like. Right. <laughs> uh, Worthington White Shield. Uh, that beer was good. I love you. I, I, I do too. But you know, uh, you've got a beard. You have to get it over. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, this is we, what happens when we drink celebration. We, do, we start we, to become we, really friendly. Yeah, did we answer everything? Did we answer? No, I saw a question. Oh. Pre-bottle uh, conditioned. Well, actually, if you if you have the uh, draft version, so the version on tap, you'll know what it tastes like before it's bottle conditioned. But honestly, when it's actually bottled, the day it's bottled, uh, I always, it, it's, it's really like when people come to the brewery to visit um, and, and we're giving them a tour a lot of times, like a great way of, of showing what bottle condition actually does to a beer is uh, I let them try uh, the beer pre-bottle conditioning. So it's, it's usually overly sweet. It's undercarbonated. Uh, it's kind of lackluster a little bit and what happens during that bottle conditioning process. But if you have celebration ale on tap, celebration is not bottle condition or not keg conditioned. So, uh, so that'll give you an idea. So. I think I saw a question Terrence about how long does it take? Did I see that? Yeah. How, how long does bottle? Okay. So we, we taste, um, in sensory, we taste it at, at day 10. Usually all of our bottle conditioned beers are tasted at day 10. Uh, Bigfoot, we kind of move it a little bit because that's, uh, just cause of the amount of alcohol, uh, the, the, the yeast is a little slower for bottle conditioning process. Uh, but we taste it day 10 and we're all trained with a palate of knowing kind of 
what's going to happen in the next couple of days. Uh, and then it doesn't leave our warehouse until about day 14, sometimes 13, 14, but uh, we'll, we'll definitely taste it at, uh, if it's going to leave at day 13, we'll taste it again just to make sure it's it's ready to go and, and go out. Because because once it gets shipped, it's going cold. It's going cold shipping. So, And you're not going to get that bottle conditioning process. So we do our, if there's any home brewers out there, all of our bottle conditioning takes place at about 62 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is what we do, which is roughly about 20 Celsius, right? Did I do that? Did I do good on that, Popa Foam? <laughs> Well, I don't know. I've not got it in front of me, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. The question for you, I think, Charlie, maybe? No? Do more beers? Uh, oh, thanks. We should do this beer tasting every oh. day, actually. I know. <laughs> All right. We're moving into Dankful. Uh, thank we're you. all Dankful. Thanks for coming today. All right. I got I to gotta finish my celly, though, first. Yeah, this is where we break break into all the the bad dank puns, and thank you puns. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thanks for coming, everybody. Always bigger. Oh, indeed, yes. I, I think I did okay, Charlie. Didn't I? You didn't do as well as I did. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why he's called the Pope of Foam. Yeah, someone like that. That's right. The Sultan of Suds. Eh? So I know we probably have a, a few new listeners. What does that do, Charlie? Why why do you pour with vigor? Uh, to produce the foam. If you don't, if you, if you pour it real gently, you won't produce the bubbles. And despite what anybody will say to you, a beer with a good foam and it looks a lot better is a lot a lot more appealing. And yeah, I've been I've been looking at this since 1978, and uh, I can just tell you that um, damn, you're old. Foam matters, you know. So if you don't produce it, you ain't gonna get it, you know. Yeah, so very important. 1978. I was I was 11 years old. I was four. <laughs> It's funny because like half the people that are listening, like I, I think everybody should comment like uh, how old they were when it started. <laughs> in 1978, I I had permed her. I had permed her. You know, yeah. Why have we not seen this picture? No, well, the I've, seen it. It. I've seen it. There, there is one of Charlie and. Uh, didn't you have bell bottoms? You wore bell bottoms. No, I had bell bottoms. I had purple trousers. Uh, sorry, uh, an orange. Uh, the day I met my wife in 1972, I had orange, an orange vest and purple bell bottom trousers. I, I was gorgeous. Wow. Did you, have, you know, you and, and Byron, I made you look sort of clean shaven. <laughs> <laughs> Would you consider yourself a, a, a hippie, Charlie? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, yeah. But there we go. Yeah. Happy days. And we digress, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thankful, thankful. All right. Um, this is generously hoppy. Yes. Right. I'm going to pull my notes out because I'm All right. Forest. I did write it down, Terrence. Seven I know hops. I Seven hops. Seven hops. We got Columbus. Okay. We got right. Chinook. I got, I, got my, I got my notes right here. I'm a yep. We got Mosaic. We got Equinot, we got Nelson, we've got one of our favorites here, Zappa. Zappa. And then last but not least, we got Idaho Seven. So the so, seven, seven rounds out the seven. Yep. Out. Yep. There we go. Let's go. So this I is have I have it written down, by the way. I didn't remember that. We we did several times where we tried to remember them all. Charlie, you would have been laughing at us for not. So I know I know Charlie uh Charlie studied up on all these beers. So this has a little bit of rye in it, a little, little rye malt. So um, what does rye do to a beer? I know well, what it does to my sandwich. It makes it taste good. <laughs> I mean, rye is, it's going to perhaps give a little bit of dryness, but it's uh, rye is, uh, it's going to give you some uh, beta glucans and, and things like that. So it's going to give some smoothness, a little bit more smooth palate probably to the, uh, to the product um i I've, i have never uh, back in the day we never used any rye or anything like that so uh, but um in bass but uh so it's not it's not a, a cereal that i know a hell of a lot about but uh i you know again it will it, it's going to be like the oats it's going to give you more of that uh, beta glucan polysaccharide sort of nature god I'm, I'm using big words now sorry no that's okay 
to me it adds a little uh kiss of spiciness to it like on the on a like on the palate a little bit i love the aroma of this beer though it's mm -hmm. like i you, you you crack it you crack open a can and it's like it it pops right yeah, yeah it does it does what do you think what do you think byron uh, it kind of smells like uh, Chico biking around Chico late October. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, with the, you know, the, the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like someone's someone's shed up in uh, Megalia around All this right. time of year. Yeah. Right. What do you think, Terrence? Well, I, I wouldn't know what that uh, that that is, but uh, <laughs> I've, I've I've never uh, dabbled in that uh, that uh, wacky tobacco. Yeah. You were the one straight edge, uh, dateful, grateful dead fan. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Byron. Bring it back home. Bring it I back. Was, home. I was doing a presentation in, in uh, Humboldt County one time. The only time in my life they took a weed break halfway through the, uh, presentation. <laughs> the presentation. Yeah, nice. They left me standing there as well. They, you know, <laughs> didn't they ask you to join. <laughs> just, left, just left me standing there, you know. I had no idea what the hell was happening. Uh, I bet uh, my brother was there. Uh, <laughs> anyway. um, so uh, th this beer is great too. Um, so this actually this this beer is is kind of uh, uh, allowed us another avenue too. Of uh, we're we're we have a thankful program where we're actually. Uh, uh, contributing to nonprofits of of our choice, uh, of which uh, we started with uh, World Central Kitchen uh, as one of our first donations. Um, so it's it's the Dankful program uh, presented by Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Um, and so, Byron, you want to you want to talk a little bit about uh, World Central Kitchen and and yeah, you Byron know, Joseph. Ken Ken likes to do. You know, we did this, we did. Was it Thanksgiving that this originally yeah. was one of the sister beers yeah. came out of? And then we did Resilience. And it's really out there to raise awareness, you know. And Ken, with the World Central Kitchen, it, it's kind of crazy because they actually came here uh, right after the campfire. And Ken, of course, you know, wanted everybody to come in. And this is the things that he does. And this is what this whole theme of this program is, is to you know, help these nonprofits out. And so they come here, Ken's like, let's set up in the big room. We'll do a turkey day dinner for everybody. And the funny thing that came out of this is like the guys from there are like, well, that's great. We'll do turkey dinner, but how are we going to make, you know, we'll have to do something other than mashed potatoes. And Ken was kind of like, can't do turkey day without mashed potatoes. Like what, what are you going to put the gravy in? And so they're like, we don't have a, we don't have anything big enough to boil hundreds of pounds of of mashed potatoes and ken being ken had just bought the the old gilman brew house back from eureka and so the first thing that he did on this with our partnership with world central kitchen was to not make beer on his original brew house but boil hundreds of pounds of potatoes for that dinner so yeah it's 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 and so he's continued to do that and we'll, we'll be picking other nonprofits uh, that Ken will will be helping out and partnering together with. So yeah, it's it, it's part of Ken's philosophy is to give back to the community, and this this goes back to that. So I told I told the story uh, of uh, that, that when we had that dinner, that that Thanksgiving dinner. Of course, we didn't want there all around Chico um, in the neighboring communities. We were trying to feed people, and so we actually shut the brewery down from you know having beer available we didn't want a bunch of people to just come into our location to uh to have the beer um so so we said no beer during that time um but uh jose andreas who uh, runs uh you know famous chef i had never heard of him uh and and didn't know anything about him right uh but anyways uh, all of a sudden there's this guy on my shoulder and he's like hey you know i'm at a brewery and i can't even drink a beer and uh, so Ken and uh, and our plant manager like look over at me and they're like, hey, can you go take get them a beer? And I'm like, oh, OK, you say go have a beer. We'll go have a beer. So him and I went upstairs and uh, we started sharing a couple beers. And and that's whenever I found out who he was. And I was like, oh, man, what a what a 
cool dude, you know, like it was pretty cool. You know, this is why I'm so proud to be associated with Sierra Nevada, this thing, the whole, the whole family, you know, everybody can the whole the whole team the whole family uh and i've used family in the broadest sense it's it's just very special to uh to be associated with uh, amazing ideas you know yeah it's so much good you know? just fun stuff i mean like when you look at resilience i mean that that literally touched it touched our oh. community but it also yeah. touched touched our uh employees you know we had 50 yeah, yeah. people that lost houses and yeah that's right. why, would, why wouldn't we uh, do something to care for them? You know, so you know, people say to me, you know, and I I did a, a presentation this week for a, a recorded presentation for a big meeting down in Brazil. I, you know, these days I'd love to have been there, but you know, I did it from my home. You know, but but I pointed out, you know, I mean, it's a presentation all about quality. Well, quality is all about people. You know, right? It, it's 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 it's. And if you've got people who care, they care about the product, but they also care about the environment, they care about society, whether it's society within the brewery or outside the brewery, you know, this this is a shining example of, of caring, you know, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, and at 7.4%, it's definitely going to make this holiday season a lot more enjoyable, like... It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit lower in uh, in alcohol as well, which uh, you know, again, uh, just got this nice, nice. It's just warming, a beautiful, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a nice beer. It's really yeah. nice. So I think it. I think we're at that moment of uh, we've gone really long, uh, but you know, it all. It always uh, we always tail stuff out because uh, we're we're going through three beers. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, I think this is uh, maybe question time. I don't know if Kevin has more questions or um, how that's how that's working. Marco. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. Byron, you get to read all the questions. Uh, 6-14 and thankful. I'm not sure what that first part is, but uh, I look forward to tasting it. What flavors did you notice? Do you notice the Zappa? All right, Terrence. Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, for me, I get, um, you know, this is a very resinous beer, uh, very mouth coating. Uh, I get a big uh, hop wallop. Um, I do, um, you know, Zappa is one of those hops that really, to me, and and I gotta try to. Uh, I'm gonna kind of make up a number but i gotta say it's about 10 percent zappa hop in this um and that actually does add like kind of a dankiness uh to me you know which is which is what i get from that kind of uh humboldt county type of type of smell uh like i and someone asked me to describe what danky actually is and 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 I think it's a lot of different flavors because you know j just like hops, there's uh, many different varieties of uh, uh, marijuana, and, uh, and and they all have like different smells and that kind of stuff. So so for me, the hops kind of incorporate that that kind of same thing. You know, you'll get fruity notes, you get woody notes. Um, you know, I get I get all that in this. Like I think with the seven hops that are in this. Uh, it's got a real great balance of some fruitiness. It's got some tropical fruit notes. It's got some woody notes. Um, you know, I get like, like I really like, like Torpedo has a lot of that kind of cedar notes. I don't really get cedar. I get a lot of pine type of notes in this one more. So, no. yeah. Yeah, I, I don't get some tropical from Mosaic too. Yeah. And Mosaic was such a fun hop to do hop rubs with this year. We ended up doing like 20, 30 lots of Mosaic. And right. mosaic, mosaic before you put it in the kettle versus mosaic in the beer. You know, sometimes I would notice it, and it took me a while. I'm like, man, what's that smell that I'm getting from mosaic? And it was really distinct and kind of hooked. And then I figured out, being the the gearhead that I am, it had kind of almost like that that rubbery smell of doing a burnout next to a fruit stand, like and which. And that's you know, why you change it. That's why yeah, you change up yeah. the backdrop. That's why right. it, it, it was, but it, it's so fruity in the beer. Like it's so, it's so much fun and you never know what you're going to get. 
You know, a few years ago, I, I, I had a student, Brian Donaldson, who uh, used to work for Sierra Nevada oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and uh, went to uh, Lagunitas. And he, his master's thesis was all about hop aroma. And the idea was to really come up with a nice lexicon, a nice set of words that described the aroma for different hops and so on. And I tried to get support and money from the, the hop industry. And they said, come on, Charlie, you know as well as I do that, you know, the, you know, the aroma of hops and the aroma of the beer that the hops go into, not necessarily simply related, you know. Yeah. And, and it's a very complicated thing that you, you, you can take different hops and you rub them between your hands and you get different aromas. But when you put them into beer, particularly when you sort of, you know, got various hops mixed together and so on, and depending on the, the alcohol content of the beer and so on, you can actually get some interesting results that don't necessarily simply relate to the aroma of of the hop which is a, a an amazing thing and i guess it also comes back to this you know art versus science right yeah. absolutely and then there was a there was a question on uh, uh the difference between dankful and thanksgiving uh it's mainly mainly hop profile uh i do not think uh thanksgiving had rye malt in it so we changed up uh uh, it, it's quite a bit different. I mean, they're both IPAs, but um, but the hop profile is definitely different on them. So, uh, can you talk about your water profile for your IPAs? Mm. Uh, <laughs> Charlie, I'm going to let you. I water chemistry is not my uh, not my thing. Uh, well, I can't I can't speak because I, I a because I'm not qualified to or uh, or allowed to, and b because uh, I don't know exactly what the water profile is for your IPAs. All I would say is that uh, you know water is a, a critical issue, um, and it is of course pronounced the T in the middle of it, water, um, and and it's important for the the quality of the beer, the the brewing process will depend on the water. And of course, you've you've got to you've got to make sure your water is matched. So between Mills River and Chico, if you're brewing the same beer, you you got to you got to make sure the water is matched. And you adjust the water. You can strip out the salts, and you can add the salts and so on until you get exactly the the right water. Um, so. Uh, I would say this, that uh, the traditional thinking for for ales, mm-hmm. if you go back to sort of the, the waters from Burton-on-Trent, where I used to be, yeah, they tended to be pretty hard, very, very hard water. And, um, you know, in Burton-on-Trent, it's the hardest water in the world. You know, it's, uh, you know, 300 more parts per million calcium. So very, very high water. I wouldn't think uh, hard water. I, I wouldn't think you'd be going as high as that in calcium in uh, in uh, the in Sierra Nevada, but um, it's going to be um, a substantial amount of calcium in there. Yeah, yeah, that's where we play with a lot of uh, calcium sulfate and calcium chloride uh, with with our IPAs and kind of and actually we'll we'll point that out. We were, we were going to have a brewer here, but I think uh, I think there's a bad storm rolling through. Uh, Part of that hurricane that's coming through uh, Mills River right now. So uh, we had some uh, spotty uh, electricity, I would say. Uh, well, one, of our, one of our workers so, out in North Carolina couldn't leave their house because their driveway had become a river. Uh, nice. Yeah, so uh, they, they they called it a day and we're like, we're not going to work today. Yeah. yeah. I hope everyone out there stays safe. Yes. Our thoughts absolutely. are with you. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Uh, how does rye differ from wheat? Um, you know, a lot for me personally, uh, total different flavor profiles, different, you know, uh, uh, rye, rye, rye to me adds, uh, that, you know, I mentioned it earlier, kind of that spiciness. I sometimes get a little bit of like, uh, 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 green bell pepper type of notes with it. Uh, it does, it is very aromatic, uh, wheat. Weed, I find just uh, like more of a mouthfeel uh, type of characteristic that I get uh, from it. But uh, Charlie might be able to point out a little bit like the. Oh, as I've said coming. already, I've, I've, I've not got a, a lot of experience working with rye. All I can tell you is that, I mean, 
the rye contains a lot of what we call beta-glucan, which is the same sort of stuff you get from the oats and your cereals and so on. Wheat uh, doesn't have so much, but but wheat is uh, is great for foam stability. Um, so the proteins from the wheat are, are really special for improving the foam stability. Um, and uh, but but otherwise, I'm, I've I've never personally uh, brewed beers with rye. Yeah, I think that the two of those, uh, like, I don't, I don't get a lot, a lot of similarities where I'll find sometimes like oats and wheat are kind of, they have that similar kind of texture on the mouthfeel to me. It, it, it kind of smooths and rounds uh, the beer out a little bit, kind of, kind of makes it a little bit more uh, uh, velvety or creamy yeah. in essence. So, yeah. So. Uh, what's the key to your uh, great head retention on all your beers? Aha. Uh, lots lots of malt and lots of hops, right, Charlie? I mean, what, what well, do they do? The two main components for uh, foam stability are protein and uh, bitterness. And uh, the, uh, the protein is going to come from the, the grist. And, of course, uh, Sierra Nevada use a lot of malts. Uh, a lot of malt, and uh, don't tend to use uh, any uh, anything that's going to dilute that out. And the second thing is um, bitterness. And the higher the bitterness, basically, the better the foam stability. So there aren't too many really low bitterness beers within the sea of a foam foam. So you got everything going for it. And it, it, it Good brewing practice as well. Yeah, it took us a long time to get Charlie to turn to that uh, high high IBU beers. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there now. You know? All right, right. <laughs> we got them in your wheelhouse now. Yeah, you certainly so. have. That so, was always yeah. a trick that uh, we do with home brewing, especially when you start to creep up in the super high alcohol beers, whether or not it was a wheat beer or not. Always, you know, always throw like half a cup to a cup of wheat in your grist bill. And you will be amazed at the the change that it has over the head retention and doesn't really affect the flavor of the beer. So yeah. that's definitely something like once you get past, I think Charlie could probably cue on on this, like between like seven and eight percent, that alcohol tends to really, really make um, the beer unable to retain head and it collapses pretty quick. So, yeah, when you, when, when you get up. Beyond, yeah, but even even with uh, terraces that appeared, but it, uh, when you uh, when uh, you know people say to me because I always point out the number one foam negative material, the most damaging material in in, in beer for for foam is the alcohol. And people say, well, I, I got I, I got beer at ten percent alcohol. It's got a perfectly good foam. And I say, yeah, but you because you got a load of protein, a lot of bitterness. So so you know a big foot is going to have a you know, a decent head on it because there's all this protein and all this bitterness. But, but you know, when you get up to uh, these crazy alcohol beers like the end of history for a brood, brood dog, you know, 55% alcohol, there ain't no head on that. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how much wheat you use. If you could, if you could afford it, you know, there's right. no fault with it. So what's the point, you know? I had to turn my camera off because I didn't want you guys to see my... Uh... Derriere, why I went and got another beer. It won't be the first time in a while. I know, I know. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> but do you snore? Uh, no, I don't. I lost. I, I lost uh, thirty pounds after COVID. I don't snore anymore. Yeah, I've lost uh, forty pounds. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Well, I lost out. I only lost ten. You look great. You look great. I got uh, like a turkey now. Man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are all your beers brewed with whole cone hops or uh, brewed using uh, whole cones? Not anymore. Uh, but our core beers all do. So uh, uh, when you start looking at uh, Pale Porter and Stout, um, they're they're all still whole cone hops. Uh, some of our new uh, Hazy IPA uses uh, some some. We got a jet oh, yeah. flying over. Uh -oh. uh, but uh, Hazy Hazy uses some uh, hot powders uh, that we use uh, in that. So it's just straight lupulin gland. Uh, so I guess cryo hops, if you know what yep. those are. That's yeah, I think, band band. yeah, I think the important thing to say about that is, you know, they're not, you know, they're not a million miles from the uh, 
for the native hop. It's just the actual the part of the hop that provides the bitterness and the uh, and the oils. Yeah, uh, you know, in itself. Yeah. 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 Definitely. So. Yeah. Um, so we're we're I think we're we're maybe rounding. Uh, wait, I shouldn't say that. Rounding the corner. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. That's an <laughs> overused term. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, but I think uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. We're we're about an hour, uh, 10 minutes. And uh, I think we added everything. Kevin, is there more questions? I think we have a few moments for if there's a few more questions. Oh, there is more questions. Here we go. Uh, is Bigfoot really open fermented with wild yeast? Oh, hell no. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, there's no, no wild yeast in uh, Bigfoot. It's, I think uh, one of the confusions is uh, what that comes with, you know, that's a pretty common question that I get. Oh, really? A lot of people believe that open fermenters and cool ships mm. are the same thing where, you know, okay. they, they look the same uh, with an open fermenter. You're basically brewing the beer, but you're pitching it with yeast before it goes into that. So you're not collecting the wild flora and fauna to right. actually ferment that out and, so and and it's a controlled environment so it's positive yeah. pressure room um so filters and things like that maybe charlie do you have any anything to uh, any input on open fermentation because yeah, but another thing about open fermentation is that uh you know you got a lot of yeast in there and again i you know i'm, I'm always accused of, of I, i'm an old man so i tell the same things over and over again but i'll say it again you know i mean the difference you know, it's it's like going to Old Trafford football ground. I mean, I'm 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 a Wolverhampton Wanderers supporter. I wear gold and black. You go to Old Trafford, Manchester, Manchester United, they wear red. You know, there's seventy thousand people. Well, when it's not COVID time, there's seventy thousand people there, and there's me uh, in gold and black. I'm dead. I'm, I'm completely <laughs> dead. You know? But you got you got all these yeast cells. You got approximately one million yeast cells in every milliliter for every degree Plato. So, you know, that's so you, that's let's, say you've got, let's say you've got 20 Plato. So you've got 20 million cells in every milliliter, you know? So, you know, bacteria and yeast, they don't get a chance. You know, the other wild yeast, they don't get yeah. a chance. You know, they just don't get a chance. Yeah. Yep. All right. Cool. Thank you. All Everybody. Right. I'm, I'm glad we're back on Facebook Live. If people want to comment and say you enjoy these, we'll do more. I know we had a, a little hiatus there, but uh, I think we we're all on vacation, right? We we're all like uh, yeah. traveling the world. Uh, no, not really. I'm just kidding. But, uh, uh, if you guys have any other questions, comments, always leave them. Uh, one of us will get back. No. Uh, you'll probably get more of a straight answer at you know, 10 in the morning than you will at, you know, five, six in the evening like we are now. But yeah, we, we love to hear from you guys. Yep. We're coming up, uh, by the way, we're coming up on our 40th anniversary, the actual date. I think we're putting some stuff together uh, yep. for the month, month of November. Uh, so the official date is November 15th. So if you want to mark that on your calendar of uh, like celebrate 40 years of Sierra Nevada, I think that's when Ken sold or brewed his first batch of beer. Yeah, it's the first batch of stout, yep. which is why that brew house is on there. So, yeah, yep. And uh, and if there's any Alpha Hop members out there uh, wondering, uh, we're going to look at the release for November nineteenth. Um, anyways, we have new beers coming for twenty twenty one. We have a, uh, a uh, Imperial IPA called Big Little Thing that's going to be. Uh, coming down the corridor and uh, a new spring seasonal, which is, uh, I think I can announce this. I don't care. I'm going to announce it anyways. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, Go a for it. it's a nectarine ale. Uh, it's really good. Um, so anyways, uh, cheers to everybody. Uh, cheers to the bronze medal uh, at the GABF for uh, the original stout uh 1979 stout uh that that ken designed charlie's already done with all his beers we gotta give him another beer he's waiting right. for you to wrap it up so he can i know i know okay uh, <laughs> Char charlie thank you byron thank you always thank a pleasure you. 
Yeah, thanks. Thanks to everybody uh, tuning in, and uh, we will hopefully see you really soon. We got to do this again. Yep. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Bye.